Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, my name's Ryan, and I, I'll start, I guess, in a few minutes. Um, if people would like to share where they're, where they're from in the chat, that would be pretty cool. I know that's a bit of a cliche question, share where you're from in the chat, but it's nice, isn't it? I'm from the UK, um, from a small town called Kettering. It's not the most exciting place in the world, but it's home. Um, I'm in Berlin. I see some people from Berlin. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, this is uh, New York. Oh, that's pretty cool. Normandy. Nice. Korea. I used to live in Korea. Great. Okay, I'm going to share my screen just to make sure that works. Of course, it's going to work. It works. Oh, now I can't see the chat. Okay. Or can I? Okay, we'll give it one more minute. Aha, I can see the chat. Okay. Okay, so I'll get started just in case um, we have, maybe we'll have time afterwards to, um, I, I could answer some questions. Okay, so um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a talk uh, about a language lead. Uh, this is a talk about a language teacher who attempted to, who is attempting to learn a language. Um, my name's Ryan. Um, I'm a curriculum developer at a company, at a language learning uh, company called Chatterbug, um, and I'm a recovering monolingual, uh, a monolingual English teacher, to be precise. Um, so a little about me, uh, I started teaching English uh, around 13 years ago, and pretty much since then I've been trying to learn a second language. Um, and I've made various failed attempts since then. Uh, I, I, did, I did pretty good with Chinese when I lived there. Um, but I didn't get past, say, A2. Uh, and so this, this talk is about me doing a little bit better and um, with German and, and, yeah, getting to a place in a second language that I'd, I'd always wanted to. Um, uh, of course, I have much further to go, but so far, so good. And, um, yeah. So, but, but what I want to talk to you today, talk to you about today, is, is, is about how the, the process of learning a language, and specifically about getting into the intermediate stages, felt a lot differently, a lot different to how I expected them to, to feel, uh, coming from the perspective of someone who's been teaching a lang language, uh, teaching language for a long time um, and in general I, I expected it to be a more straightforward and generally faster um, process um, and, and I think the reason for this is that I framed learning a language in terms of effort. I, I said I, I, I always thought that if you put in the work uh, the results will inevitably come. And I think that is true, but I was surprised in learning German that, um, that, that I have actually, you know, I've been quite studious um, in, in the last three years, and yet fluency has still been a little bit elusive. Um, so uh, in preparation for this talk, I really wanted to take some time to to dig, dig into why and specifically to find out why my expectations of where I would be by now um, have been a bit different from the reality. Um, about why uh, certain assumptions I made uh, and, and still make um, haven't quite been right. So, 
I'm framing this in terms of a series of lies that I'm convinced I, uh, I've told myself over the years. Um, so these are small little deceptions, I guess you could say. Uh, they're things that I think conceal uh, more general and common uh, language learning problems. So um, yeah, so and I, and I hope that this talk will be useful to, to students and teachers alike. Um, uh, part of the uh, inf self investigation, if you will, of digging into one's own experience. I think it's really important uh, for, for teachers to do this. And the, the reason being is that, you know, putting yourself in other people's shoes and to, to understand what they're going through is really quite it's really quite hard. Uh, so if we can if we can take lessons from our own uh, experiences, then then that's that's useful. Um, so let's dig into the to the lies. So lie number one. Oh, gone too far. Lie number one. Um, fluency is just around the corner. Now this is something that I'm sure a lot of us feel right we we go you know if i if i do x and then i do y and i do it for a, a few weeks a few months and you know I'll, I'll be in that place um but for some reason fluency is always a little bit further away than 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 what you might than you first expect um and you can be forgiven for for thinking that um you know uh, it's, it's, I think it's natural. I think we underestimate what we need to do. Um, and yeah, and, and I think what, what it is that we underestimate is, is the sheer amount of what we need to know, need to learn in terms of a, a quantity. Um, and so my first, the first thing I want to focus on in, in this part is really how we uh, perceive of the size and the scale of the, the languages we're trying to learn. Um, and, and say, so we can answer questions like, how much, how much study does someone who wants to speak near native Italian, how much study do they have ahead of them? You know, I mean, really, realistically, what, what would the roadmap be? Uh, and so I have an analogy that is a little strange for language learning, but um, let's see how it goes. So this, um, this is a problem uh, in geography about how to measure uh, the length of a coastline. Um, and the interesting thing about this problem is that if you measure using a map at a small scale, like the, the map of Ireland that you can see on the, on the left, then um, you get a smaller measurement than if you uh, measure using a larger scale map. And you, you can probably guess why um, that in the, 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 the part of the map on the right, you can start to see all these small details. And, and naturally, if you were to measure around all of those rocky coves, you're gonna get a longer, a longer measurement in the end. So, so what happens is the further you zoom in, the more detail that is revealed and the longer the measurement. And what's kind of crazy about this is that there isn't any fixed point where, you, where, where it stops and you get the, 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 the objectively right measurement. It keeps going. As you can imagine, walking along the beach with a ruler in your hand, going around every rock and stone, it, it's, a, it's kind of a crazy problem. So what does this have to do with languages, I hear you say? Well, I'm going to try and translate that into another analogy that maybe is a bit more fitting for language learning. Um, so I want you to imagine that one day you say to yourself, I want to learn German, as I have done, and as many of you might be doing. Um, and so Naturally, you, you walk into a bookshop, looking on the right shelf in the relevant section, uh, you see six 
six German textbooks in a row, A1 to C2. This is our, if you, if you will, this is our uh, small scale overview of the island, our island of language, let's say. Um, and what is it? It's, it's, it's without detail. It's very, um, it's very, uh, how would you say, incomplete, undetailed. It's representative, but it, it leaves out all of the, the finer aspects of what a language is. And we could zoom in to this picture. Um, and what we have then is, is more detail, words, grammar, um, phrases, all the smaller components that we, we begin to learn when we begin to learn a language. Um, but of course, language is a, a super complex thing. So you can always zoom in th further. And, and then we, we, we start to see more and more the very specific idiomatic specialist things. And these are all these things together are what what it, it what one needs to kind of take on board to to become fluent. So to conclude this small section, um, when people dream of learning another language, you know, what, what they're really doing is they're well, most people in their heads imagine being able to have the kind of uh, fast moving conversations that they have in their own languages. And the reality of that is that what you need to be able to do that is you need to know a lot of the language, a lot of individual components. And it's, and it's just the, the point of this is just that languages are really um, content heavy and that's it's a problem. So um, in my life, in my German learning um, uh, thing, I, I was, you know, I was telling myself that I needed to do X and Y to, but then but the, the result I wanted was much, much more than X and Y together. It was, I wanted like um, a fluency, a freedom in fluency to kind of uh, converse at will, to switch topics and to um, go down strange conversational paths without having to think about it. But of course, that's doable in the long run, but, but I, I was being perhaps a little, uh, uh, un, I was deceiving myself exactly how long it would take to get there. Okay, so one last thing about, um, about this aspect, this, this lie, um, so what do we do to stay motivated when a goal is so elusive? Uh, when, when it in fact takes many years to get where, to where we want to go. Um, so I think what we need to avoid is this idea that, that, we, that we never seem to be getting anywhere. And I think like the, the character on the left is someone who with, with the wrong expectations has, has felt disappoint, disappointment constantly and, and says, what's the point? What's the point of um, taking the next couple of lessons of spending two hours on a Saturday uh, going through my textbook? I, I'm not moving anyway, so this is just a waste of time. But, but I, I think that putting it into the right framework knowing that these are really complicated endeavors that we're set out upon, that when, when you frame it in a bit of a, a, a grander way, then your two hours on a Saturday morning, you can see, well, it's only two hours, but I'm still moving and there is a, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so my recommendation or the, the thing I'd like to conclude this section with is to talk about what we can do as learners and as teachers. So we the, the, the road is the, the road the road to fluency is long and um, longer than perhaps we can reasonably keep our our most basic motivations going for. So 
for something as long term as learning a language, I think we really need to find ways to um, merge the, the the hobby of language learning with our wider, our, our more personal interests. Um, and, and I think that I think too that this is something that educators should really be thinking about is how can um, how can how can students be allowed to be given the opportunity to explore um, all of the things that interest them in life if it's history or, or games or you know board games or whatever whatever it is you you're, you're interested in how can you do that and bring the bring the language you're learning with you so that's lie number one um, that hopefully um, we can stay on track through these challenging things um, and come out or keep going through uh, keeping ourselves interested. Um, okay, so let's move on to the second of the two lies, the three lies. Um, I hope you are all well as I talk to you. Okay, let's keep going. Right. So, line number two. Uh, okay, I will. Ma I will somehow magically absorb all the words I need to know. Yeah, this one. This one comes. This one I came to think. Start thinking about because I noticed that I. I was. I was struggling to remember all of the words that you, you need to remember when learning a language. Um, and I, I knew that I would have to work for it. I didn't think that they would really uh, magically um, adhere themselves to me. But I, I, just, I just didn't realize how much, um, how much work every, each and every one of them needs to, to, to keep them um, strong. Um, okay. So I'm worried I'm going to run out of time, so I better move a bit faster. So the, the, the problem with, um, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the problem with, with vocabulary in general is that we, we too often try to remember it um, without, without context, devoid of context and lacking in connections to other things that we um, that we know and care about. So um, the 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 real the thing we need to do to um, the thing we need to do is to build these associations um, uh, and attach to words, um, scenes, settings, situations, imagery, um, and and really think that words need to be uh, given meanings rather than simply having them. Um, and we are creatures of habit. So let's move on to that slide. <laughs> oh, I missed this one. So yeah, so I wanted to make a, uh, a point in this slide that, um, that certain words come loaded with context while others are often given to us without much at all and with simply just a translation and they, um, they, they're just harder to to remember and, and we challenge ourselves to remember them, but we, we don't allow ourselves to create the, um, the context we need to do that. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the thing I wanted to suggest in this regard was, was to think about how habits can help us with this. And the classic way of thinking about vocabulary is to is to use some kind of app and to to basically hammer it into your memory to keep going. And those things totally work. And I and I and I use those things. Um, but in in terms of this this problem of of context and the problem of of perhaps not seeing these words enough so that your your memory is refreshed of them. My, my feeling is that we could use 
uh, habit building. The building of small habits in particular to kind of do a lot of the hard lifting for us. So one thing I do is I, um, every morning when I make coffee, I listen to about 10 minutes of a German podcast. And I've been doing this for about, only for about a month, but it, it's something that's become really easy to do. I, I don't have to think about it. And, um, and it keeps me in contact with, um, with, with German while, um, while always hearing something, or hearing this vocabulary, this, this stuff that I'm worried about forgetting, um, I'm, I'm always hearing it in a context, you know, I mean, uh, the podcast today, the say I, I listened to it, it was about coronavirus because everything's about the coronavirus, but still the words I heard, I, I you know, I, I know about the coronavirus. So when I hear new words, you know, I can start to uh, add to them, give them flavor, give them some weight and color and, uh, and, and, and help them to stick. You know, because that's the that's the problem, isn't it? Okay, let's move on to our third and final lie, the most difficult one of all, in my opinion. How can we make progress? Uh, I sorry, the lie is I can make progress without speaking to strangers. Now, this you could, you could, and you can um, learn a lot at home. Uh, in different ways of studying. But what I always notice is that when I am a, you know, a hard, hardworking student of German in, in my home, but then I, 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 I wimp out of talking to people outside, when I need to um, have, when I need to communicate something, that I can't find the right words to do it. And, and I think because I, I'm just, avoiding these situations too much and and the, and the problem is is that it, it's this scary you know it's it's natural to have like social anxiety especially when um you're doing it in uh, a second language um and really it's it's natural you know we we are we're scared of making mistakes in front of people that will judge us for those mistakes that's our assumption. Of course, people, most of the time, people don't judge us. Um, I, I, I don't judge people for making mistakes in English. And half the time, I don't notice that people make mistakes. My girlfriend asked me to correct her and I go, I don't really notice. Um, but we still, it's natural. And yeah, and so I have an, 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 an analogy, an, an analogy for this one as well. So um, basketball. Um, so we, we need to become fluent, we want to become fluent conversationalists that can interact with people uh, whenever the need arises. But we, 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 I, this, this analogy is just to make the point that we really need to get real practice. Um, and the analogy is that imagine a basketball player trying to become a really good basketball player only by training in the gym, lifting weights for strength, stretch, stretching for flexibility, but never, but never picking up a ball, never um, making a layup. You know, it, you wouldn't develop. He, the, he or she would not develop as a fully uh, developed basketball player. Um, they would have half of the skills, but not the. But they would l mostly lack the the most relevant ones, the ones that help them win a game. So now in this bit, this is where I try to give you some advice regarding this problem. Now, I don't really want to do that because it would be a bit hypocritical if I said, you know, don't be scared, just do it, when I, in fact, um, am terrified of talking to the lady at the bakery. Um, or, or, so, or, or, the, or the, the, the guy who comes to fix the gas meter or to check on the gas meter. Um, and I go, I should say something. I can't just stand here not saying anything. And I do. But so I'm going to try to uh, give some encouragement rather than advice. 
Um, and this advice um, was uh, told, uh, given to me by a colleague and I, I thought it was really good. So it's about re reframing how you see yourself in the situation. So um, we often think when we go to the pharmacy and we try to make, try to ask questions, we go, I'm a language learner trying to do a language learner thing. Well, you're not a language learner. You're, you're a person who has questions about medicine, you know? And if you could reframe yourself to, to, to think, you know, this is an interesting problem. I, I want to know about this. I want to know, you know, uh, when I can take this and when I, you know, should I take it with food or whatever. Like to be, I think to frame it is that I'm a, I'm a person involved in a, you know, uh, a medical problem. That's a weird thing to say. But to, to frame yourself as, as a, not as a language learner, like just as someone who is curious about something. If you're, if you're in a conversation with a, a, a German friend, for me, you know, I, I don't have to think, oh, I'm just, I'm only B1. I could say, no, I'm, I'm a friend trying to ask uh, a friend a curious question, you know? So that's a small, small bit of advice as to that, that final one of, you know, of fearing uh, looking foolish in, in interactions, which is totally natural. Um, so I'm going to conclude just there and conclude with the, with the, the, the few, the few points that I made for each section that in terms of the complexity of the language, um, make the, the journey is going to be long. So see how much you can merge your personal interests with the language. It's something I need to do more and, I, and I'm going to try to do more. Um, so that's that. Um, when it comes to words, if you, if you find that the, the, the vocabulary demand on you in learning a language is a burden, look for ways to, to, to bring in more and more context and more, more media, more video, more, more reading. Um, so that your words are sourced from places where they're, where they're framed in meaning. And, and the last point about um, being fearful of, um, of interactions in your, in your target language, then acknowledge that it's okay, I guess. You know, we all, I think, the, even the best of us, maybe there's a few strange people out there who have no, no fear, uh, polyglots, I think they're called. Um, but yeah, frame, frame, frame it not as um, it's as all that everything's always a, a, a language learning problem, and that you're just a language learner. But frame it as in, I'm, I belong here. I'm, I have a question. I want to ask it. It may not be perfect, but, um, but I'll try anyway. So that's my talk. Thank you everyone for attending. I think uh, I've pushed time to the end. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for attending. It was a pleasure to talk to you.